Early deaths are a major problem in acute promyelocytic leukemia. They can and should be prevented. The Leukemia and Lymphoma Society understands the importance of an accurate diagnosis of APL and the need for immediate treatment. APL is a medical emergency that has to be treated immediately. If you suspect the diagnosis, there is no downside to starting treatment right away. If the diagnosis is inaccurate, you can always step back, but withholding treatment can be detrimental to the patient. The Leukemia and Lymphoma Society can provide important resources and support for patients and caregivers throughout the cancer journey. Acute promyelocytic leukemia is a hyperaggressive leukemia that has outstanding treatments. There are seven types of acute leukemias. APL is a subtype. The thing that makes APL so different is the fact that we have outstanding treatments for APL. Approximately 90 to 95 percent of patients with acute promyelocytic leukemia can be cured. I discovered bruises everywhere. I became very, very weak. Uh, I had blood work and was put into the hospital. Um, I had a bone marrow test, and I was at that time um, diagnosed with a subgroup of, of AML, different subgroup of AML. Then uh, we got it in remission. Then again in 2009, in the spring, I got bruises again, went back to the doctor, had another bone marrow test, and I was diagnosed with APL at that time. I had a, a, actually a very sharp um, jaw pain and followed the next day with a little tightness in the chest. And uh, we did the bone marrow on Monday and I got the call on Wednesday morning following that you have acute promyelocytic leukemia and uh, you need to get in the car and go straight over to the hospital. And they told me up front that the good thing was APL is curable if caught early. And they felt that they had it very early. The initial test for APL is a routine blood test, which would be a CBC. That generally shows that the white cells, the red cells, and the platelets are low. Patients also have symptoms to go with it, such as fatigue and bruising. Once you suspect that, you do a bone marrow aspirate and a biopsy. That will usually tell you uh, whether it's APL or not. There are more sophisticated tests that we can do, such as cytogenetics, FISH, flow cytometry, and PCR, which would generally confirm the diagnosis of APL. The key to uh, managing APL is to recognize it as soon as possible. Once you recognize it, to start the treatment right away. Uh, they present in an extremely aggressive fashion uh, where they have low blood counts and a tendency to bleed. And the drugs that we have available can reverse the bleeding tendency very quickly. The key is to start the drugs right away and to provide them supportive care to prevent death during the first month after diagnosis. Early deaths is probably the most pressing problem in acute promyelocytic leukemia. So if you have a patient with uh, APL and you're suspecting it, the first thing you have to do is get them started on ATRA right away. The second thing that you have to look at is their blood counts. If their platelets are low, you would have to give them a platelet transfusion to keep it about 30 or 50,000. The other thing that you would notice is their fibrinogen will be low. And if that is the case, you would have to give them uh, fibrinogen transfusions as well. So in that way, you're doing two things simultaneously. One is you're using a drug to uh, decrease the tendency to bleed. And secondly, you're replacing factors that the patient may not have to prevent bleeding. The thing with acute promyelocytic leukemia is if you can get them through the first month, it's basically a home run. They put me in the hospital and did a bone marrow test, um, you know, ordered by my primary care doctor. And after that, um, he, he came in and told me that I had leukemia. 
they would get me started on the um, chemotherapy. So what we have done to decrease early deaths is we developed a set of guidelines that are now available that we can send to the treating physicians. Simultaneously, I think they should also call somebody who is more experienced in managing these patients. So there are two things to managing APL. One is to use uh, the guidelines that we developed as part of the standard of care. And the second thing is to seek advice from an expert who does this more often. There are at least uh, three to four different classes of drugs that can be applied in acute form allocytic leukemia. Atra by far, I think, is the most revolutionary, which uh, came in the late 1980s. Then uh, arsenic came probably uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, the anthracyclines are a very effective group of drugs. And then there are drugs that uh, are used in the maintenance phase as well. The most uh, common drugs used in maintenance are methotrexate and 6 mercaptofurin But the key is if you suspect APL, you don't necessarily have to wait for the definite diagnosis. If you do suspect that they have APL on Wednesday, don't wait. You can actually start ATRA on Wednesday. And then once the diagnosis of APL is confirmed on Thursday or Friday, then you can add additional drugs. Supposing your suspicion is wrong, you can always back off and change your treatment to something else. So giving them a day or two of ATRA is not going to harm them. But not giving it to them can actually be detrimental to the patient. What we should not forget is supportive care has also improved in the last uh, 50 years. Transfusions, antibiotics that we give, other supportive care measures have evolved during the same time. And this has actually contributed to improvement in the outcome in APL along with the revolutionary drugs that have been developed in the last 50 years. Clearly, in certain diseases, we have made tremendous advances. For instance, in chronic myelogenous leukemia, the treatments are outstanding. In acute promyelocytic leukemia, about 90 to 95 percent of patients can be cured if you treat them right, whereas in certain diseases, we are still not there. Uh, I think it's absolutely essential for us to uh, participate in clinical trials and enroll patients in clinical trials to improve outcomes. Clinical trials are very important to furthering and advancing scientific discoveries in either uh, new treatments, new devices, or just a general understanding of how to better uh, use treatment options that currently exist. Obviously, we have gotten quite far with some diseases where 80 to 90 percent of patients are cured. We did not get there just by chance. It has taken a lot of experimenting with patients to get there. But there are some diseases in which we don't have good treatments. And in order for us to improve the outcome that we currently have, we have to conduct more trials to improve patient care and to advance the results that we can produce. And the only way that we can do that is if we have uh, research study teams invested in conducting the trials in accordance with FDA and the uh, institutional review boards, uh, along with dedicated patients um, to work with their clinicians and physicians to make sure that it's the best treatment option for them at that time. I think it's absolutely important that patients participate in the clinical trials that we have. Certainly, we have made tremendous advances in certain diseases, but I don't think we are quite there. I think we can certainly improve the outcome further in those diseases. For instance, in APL, this is a disease in which maybe 90 or 95 percent of patients can be cured. And the key would be for us to put patients in these trials to prove the concept. Mm -hmm. What do you watch for during treatment? I think monitoring the blood counts on a day-to-day -day basis is key. If uh, the platelets are low, giving platelet transfusions. If there is a problem with clotting, such as the fibrinogen is low, giving them uh, fibrinogen transfusions. 
The important thing about managing these patients is a team effort. Uh, you have to have nurses who are extremely knowledgeable in taking care of patients with leukemia. Uh, nurses who know the drugs and know the complications because you will be taking care of this, uh, seeing this patient maybe for 10, 15 minutes or a half an hour a day. It's actually the nurses who are going to be there uh, uh, the whole time and they happen to be your extension <laughs> when you're not there. And in most good leukemia treatment centers, the nurses are extremely sophisticated and very cognizant uh, with the complications that these drugs can cause. And as soon as they see something, they would bring that uh, to your attention. The other thing that we do is we also have standard algorithms that we develop. If this happens, do this. If this happens, do this. So we have similar algorithms for APL as well, and we train our nurses to implement those algorithms uh, if they see any of these complications. The major complications with APL are bleeding, differentiation syndrome, infection, and multi-organ failure. The key to keeping these patients alive is to prevent these complications. As far as bleeding goes, to keep the platelet count above 50,000 and to keep the fibrinogen above 150,000. As far as differentiation syndrome goes, it can be a difficult and a tricky thing to recognize, but there are symptoms that go with the syndrome. Weight gain, hypotension, hypertension, fever are all complications of differentiation syndrome. Shortness of breath can be a complication of differentiation syndrome. The key is to recognize it early and treat them with steroids to prevent the complication. The third complication is infection. If a patient develops fever, to recognize it and start appropriate antibiotics to take care of the infection. Sometimes the drugs can result in multi-organ organ failure, but if you're careful and prevent all these complications and watch the patient's blood counts, you should be able to prevent multi-organ failure. <music>
diagnosis called acute promyelocytic leukemia. But the key is to sit with them during their initial admission and spend time. Uh, you have to let them know that you're interested, that you're not rushed with this. Sit with them and explain the uh, diagnosis and the treatments that you're going to give them and also explain the complications. When people are ill, they, they need more than just the medicines. They need more than just the procedures. They need more than just knowing all the fine things about the institution or the doctors. So I think that's very important. Take the time. Make the time. A doctor that is treating someone as life-threatening as leukemia can be. It's very important that they acknowledge that this, this is, could be a life or death situation. It's definitely a life-changing situation. Mm -hmm. And I know sometimes we can get very caught up with facts and figures and data and studies and things like that, but it's very important that you take time to make sure your heart is, is in it for that, that patient as a person, not just a patient, that they're a person and they have feelings and fears. Taking that few minutes can make such a difference. You can not only cure 90 to 95 percent of patients, but the thing is you can also mainstream them after they're done with their treatment. Not only are they cured of their leukemia, but they go back to doing what they used to do before they were diagnosed with this condition. If you would like more information on what you've heard, or for other education materials or support for your patients, we encourage you to contact an information specialist at the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society's Information Resource Center by calling 800-955-4572 or email infocenter at lls.org. We would like to acknowledge and thank Teva Pharmaceuticals for their support, which helps LLS bring you this information. On behalf of the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, thank you for joining us today.